Hi, everyone, and welcome to At Katie Couric. Today, my guest is Nancy Gibbs, one of my favorite people and writers. She was recently named executive editor of Time Magazine. Nancy's written more than 100 cover stories, including eight Person of the Year essays. And as always, we'd like to say a quick thank you to the sponsor of our web show, Dove. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Katie. First of all, congratulations. You are now the executive editor of Time Magazine. Yeah. Now, that's a big deal for people who aren't in the magazine world. What does that mean? It means I go to a lot more meetings. <laughs> oh, it does. And it means you're, what, the number two or number three number in charge? Three. Number three. So Rick Stengel. Right. And, and then Michael his... Elliott. Oh, okay. Another so how do we off Michael friends. Elliott so you can be number two? Oh, no, 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 no. We want to keep him there. <laughs> <laughs> so what exactly does this job entail? I'm still finding that out. What I loved, and I and to Rick's credit, he when he first approached me about doing this and he knew that I typically run back to my writing cave whenever this idea comes up. He said, we will tailor this to you. It's really about having you more a part of our conversation about what the magazine ought to be doing, what stories we should be doing. And it was much more, I like to say, about the takeoff than the landings. It was less be there at three in the morning making sure the captions are written than it is the fun part in my mind, which is talking to the writers and our correspondents about how do we get our arms around healthcare this week, or what should we be doing about um, returning veterans, or any what of the are topics people talking about? Right. What are you and what right. do you bring to the job? Do you think that Rick Stengel uh, basically recognized and appreciated? I think some of it is being a soccer mom, and you know that there's it's maybe easier for me, partly because I haven't been spending the last years, you know, sitting in meetings that I actually have had the, the great have luxury a of having a life. And so I sort of said, you know, if I now have to spend all my time here, it's going to make it harder to know what people are thinking about. But what I love to do is is talking to people, you know, friends, strangers who I encounter about how they're reacting either to this economy or how they're reacting to the challenges they're facing with their kids or to some development in science that's sort of troubling and perplexing because it takes us onto some new frontier where we haven't been. I love doing that and then figuring out, okay, how do we how do we bring this into the magazine and explain it in a way that will help people? But to do that, to have these conversations that elicit an aha, oh, that would be a great story moment, you have to have time to interact with other people. So it's fantastic that, that they have tailored this job and allowed you to continue having a life that exposes you to interesting people and not so interesting people, quite frankly, to hear what they're talking about. Well, that's the goal. And I'm and so I'm very excited about it. I think it's it's really going to be fun. The other thing that's fun about it, as opposed to if I had said yes to this some years back, is the great thing about time now, and because now we all can do anything we want on our website, is that we never have to do anything. It, it, when I first came to the magazine in any given week, you know, if something happened in Washington, if something, if the Supreme Court ruled in a case, we would have to do that story because, you know, you're Weird Time magazine and you have to cover Be the magazine of the record. And we're, we're completely liberated from that now. And so the things that interest us that we think are important or surprising, we can certainly do them. But there isn't, oh, OK, let's come up with some solution for some story that we actually aren't very interested in. Having said yeah. that, a story that's covered a lot in, on any given day, you all are able to kind of give it a different take, give it a different perspective, put it into context. And I think that's one of the reasons news magazines are very valuable. And, you know, I'm the biggest fan of Time and Newsweek um, because I feel like we're, we're just so assaulted by information 24-7 that sometimes we don't have time to sit back and say, what does this mean? Or how do I put this in its proper place? How do I better understand this story that I might have read just a sort of a cursory outline of? So, I mean, I think it must be very fulfilling for that reason, too. Well, that, you know, we, the, the story of the death of news magazines has been written so many times because, and especially once we went to the 24-7 news culture. And what we find, and, you know, we, it's a very concrete way we measure it, that our, our renewals were up this year, is that in a way, the more crazy the news cycle is, and the more people are having stories come at them uh, in this staccato way all through the day, they don't get a chance to make sense of it. And and nothing ever has sort of a beginning and a middle and an end. And right. the, the wonderful thing, I mean, we're part of that too um, on time.com, but in the magazine, we do get to, to 
take a little bit of a deep breath and, and say, okay, what about this really matters? And I think you're right, that right now, the need for that is in some ways greater than it's ever been. So what do you think makes a good cover story? You've done how many covers more than any other person in history? Yeah, that's... Something, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Wow. That's scary now. Someone, how many? Someone has kept count. They, I hope, stopped counting after about 130. Cause wow, then, seriously? Then, seriously. That's impressive. Well, it's, you know, there's an old news magazine saying that you have to write better than everyone who writes faster and faster than everyone who writes better. I've heard that, actually. So that's... That's not original I'm to a, you, is it's it? It's not. No, <laughs> this has been around forever. Yeah. And so I'm a very fast typist. Well, well, tell me how, what you think makes a good cover story and what cover story are you proudest of? Um, well, those are two different things, actually. I think the one I'm proudest of because... It had my name on it, but it truly, more than any story ever, was the entire staff working the together. The nine eleven story it was nine eleven. Yeah, and and you that won a was, national magazine award for that cover, didn't you? We did, and and I think it's partly it's a classic example of one. You know, it's the only time that time put a black border around um, the cover, and we did it in twenty four hours. And and I think the reason it was so important was we knew that this event. Which, about which we knew so little. We had no idea who did it. We had no idea what the larger impact of, or whether we were now at war. There was so much we didn't know on that day. Mm -hmm. But we did know that this was going to be one of the major events of our lifetimes. And to just tell the story of what happened and how this city and, and people in Pennsylvania and people at the Pentagon reacted, and how the, the government reacted, um, to capture that moment almost like a time capsule and mm -hmm. just tell that story it was something that it was very important for us to do. And so literally every single person on the staff went out, just fanned out, you know, downtown if they were in New York or, or all over Washington and were sending me emails. I think I got a thousand emails in the 24 hours and that's what that story was written out of. And you know, I think it was one of those talk about, you know, we pompously say journalists write the first draft of history. In this case, you know, that really was what we were all And you were writing doing. an essay, right, Nancy? You wrote the essay called um, If You Want a Humble Empire. And I'm curious because I think your essays are so uh, thoughtful and, 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 and thought-provoking. And, and how do you kind of, on a, on a story like that or really any other story, kind of get the view from 10,000 feet because it, you have to write it in a timely fashion, and and a lot of the stuff is still going on, and you're experiencing it sort of in real time like all of us are, and yet you have to kind of step back. Is that hard to do? Well, in that case, where literally I was on the phone with neighbors whose husbands were in the towers, and they didn't know if they had gotten out. So that was more of a real-time um, challenge than most of them are. Right. But... Um, in general, though. I, I think, you know, on something like this, it's probably the same way, you know, doctors operate. You become very sort of detached and clinical and, and go about your business. I think one of the things that I try very hard to do is is there's so much in our in our conversation right now and in our culture that is dividing people. And, and I think in some ways artificially. I think the notion that we're a divided country makes a good story. I think it's it's overtold. And there are so many. Or maybe basic it's not. Maybe that, it's it, it's not representative of of the biggest swath of people in this country. It's representative of the noisiest swaths. Yes, the noisiest uh, and the and in some ways the most marginalized. So where I try to find is is what brings us together, and that sounds very sappy, but there is I think that is where the important conversation is. You know, we're a big diverse country of three hundred plus million people with real challenges in front of us, and. Spending all of our time focusing on the on the shrillest part of the debate, as opposed to the center of it, seems to me to be a missed opportunity. And you also like to get out of politics and talk about sort of the real world. And 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 case in point is the cover story you did on the case against overparenting. You and I have talked about yeah. that uh, that cover story, and uh, it's an area of interest for me because I've always sort of been mesmerized by this whole conversation and, and parents living vicariously and being helicopter parents and, you know, just doing almost too much. And you wrote this story. Was this the, uh, was this the biggest selling time 
or something. Didn't it do it huge was, numbers? It it sold very well, I think, and it, it became sort of viral because it was the classic story that people emailed to each other because this is the conversation that we all have, right? Right. It's, you know, when do we back off and when do we move in and when do you pick up the phone and call your kid's teacher? And, and if you don't, if you sort of unilaterally disarm, are you not serving your child well? It's I know so many parents who are honestly, in a well-meaning way, wrestling with this. And most of us feel like we're getting the balance wrong. And, right. And How can you give a child self-esteem with that with, and also teach him or her to accept disappointment and learn resilience? Well, this is what teachers kept coming back to, is that is that we understand that parents don't want their children to fail. That's totally normal. But we see how damaging it is to kids who are never allowed to trip and fall and pick themselves up. And mm -hmm. you just, we have to create a situation where that is possible for them. A lot of teachers thanked you for this article, oh, yes. didn't they? Uh, it Did was a lot a little... of parents get, cr you know, crank call you and say? <laughs> no, they, oh, they was a little tricky to step foot in my daughter's school because I was sort of, you know, like, like this. But most parents, it was very funny. They were sort of sheepish and they rolled their eyes and they said, yeah, that was me. I know, you know, I'm a, I'm a part Sikorsky. You know, yeah. <laughs> so that, um, you know, I think we all, rec I mean, I'm writing about myself. I'm writing about all of us. We recognize this tendency in ourselves. And, and again, trying to get the balance right is the challenge. So I was trying to, in a way, give permi people permission to back off a little and, and not feel like they have to put their children in 50 activities and hover over everything and, and rewrite their science projects for them. And right. And as you know, you know, this, is, this has been, uh, this topic has gained popularity. I have talked about in speeches with a woman from San Diego who wrote The Me Generation about kind of giving kids so much self-esteem that, that it's just over the top. You know, everybody wins a trophy on the right. soccer team. You know, they, it's not really teaching them that life is sometimes unfair. But then George Will, I think, recently wrote about it. Did yeah. you read that piece that George Will wrote, kind of about overindulging kids? And... I think it's in in the air. And I think the interesting thing that it, it it falls into now, I don't know if you saw the the Pew Center survey about the millennial generation. That's yes. 18 to 29-year-olds. and It was and, upsetting and worrisome. Well, I was fascinated by it, because on the one hand, these kids are facing the worst economic climate of any of the last four generations. And yet I mean, they're so optimistic. And they're really optimistic. And so you think, okay, I guess it's good that they're so hopeful. I mean, it's good for the young amongst us to, you know, to... Not to be cynical. Not be cynical. <laughs> but you also wonder how much of this is unrealistic expectations on their part or that they've been too sheltered from the harsh reality that they're facing. And do they have, most importantly, do they have the resilience that they're going to need in order to cope with what is clearly going to be a challenging environment for kids coming out of school now for the, however many years going forward. Are they tough enough for it? What about the economy in general? Do you, you know, think it's getting better? It's so, you, we hear so many mixed messages. There's a good sign one day, a bad sign the next day. It's really hard to kind of feel settled about it in any way, good or bad. Well, I think it's also because it, what do we even mean by the economy? You know, it's it's you can hear one day the factory orders are up and say great or the consumer confidence is up. And then the next day, the jobs numbers are bad. And, you know, I have a friend who who just got a job after having been laid off a year ago. And when you watch families who have gone through the unbelievable strain of having someone out of work month after month after month and the relentlessness of sending out the letters and making the calls and doing the networking and everything they're having to do to try to get a job and the toll that that takes on them. I think it's going to be impossible for us to feel like we're really in a recovery until that you know sense of so many of our, of our fellow citizens for whom the struggle is just so crushing. Until the jobs issue is settled, I think it's going to be very hard to feel like we're really back on track. Do you think that, that the media have become somewhat inured to all the suffering? Because I sometimes feel like we need to show the personal stories more behind the numbers that are given relentlessly every day about this economy. You know, I wonder if, if the, do you think that some publications have kind of moved beyond that? I hope not. Well, you know, if, at one point I thought the media was that, again, a, a generalization, so nothing I can say is now going right. to apply to everyone. But because so many media organizations were going through cutbacks and, mm -hmm. and were being directly affected by downsizing, I thought, okay, maybe we're going to pay more attention because this is happening to us as well as to all of these other industries. I, 
I think that, that the problem with it is that if you look at this 10, the 10% 10 unemployment number, it's almost a meaningless number. If you are a white college educated woman of my age, the unemployment rate for women like you or me is 3.4%. If you are a black male between 18 and 24 who didn't graduate from high school, your unemployment rate is 48%. Right. So the 10% doesn't tell you anything in a sense. And, and addressing that, addressing the future that is faced by kids who aren't able to afford to go to college um, or ones who aren't able to finish college, um, what their prospects are, or who are living in regions that have really been hit hard by industrial downsizing, I think that those challenges are tremendous and we maybe are not, you know, we can't tell that story too often. It's really just going to be so much a part of our landscape now for these next few years. Let's talk about um the internet and and it so time subscriptions are up, which is great. Last year you said they're mm -hmm. up. Over last year or last year they were up. Well, the last couple years actually they have have been up, but they the latest figures I saw was that and and actually I asked how this isn't a really bad. I mean advertising is down. It's mm -hmm. a recessionary year. Why would renewals be up? And and one of our theories is that when the news is sort of serious as it is now, people's sense that we need, I need to know what's happening, I need to be on top of things, I need to be more engaged with the world, with our political culture, with um, business news, increases. And um, it's sort of an investment in as a survival thing, that, mm. they, that you don't have the luxury. In good times, you have the luxury to kind of pull back and not pay attention and tend your garden. In, in tougher times, it's that much more important to feel like you're informed and you know what's going on. Where will this magazine be in 20 years? Will I be able to hold it in my hand and read it before I go to bed at night? You know, I... In this form? I think you will, but I also hear from people who have played with the iPad that, that that's a very cool thing. And if you have a story in whatever is, you know, whatever the new digital device is that we will probably all have next to our beds, you know, in a few years, if that allows you, when there's a story that you're interested in, to go as deep into it as you want, to read as much about it as you want, or to move on to the next story. When you have that much um, power of choice over it, I think that's going to be great for us. You know, the, the one problem with, with the internet for journalists who like doing long form is that any story that's going to involve 16 screens on, on the web page is, it's, that's asking a lot of people. But the, these devices that are designed to read books on, you certainly can imagine people being happy to read three and four and 5,000 word long form journalism stories on. So I think actually there promises to be a renaissance of the kind of serious investment journalism and storytelling that you know we all love to do. But how will journalists be compensated if people don't want to pay for content on the web? There was a recent Pew study on uh, with its project for excellence in jur journalism. Only 7% of Americans say they're willing to pay for online news. And most say if their favorite news provider puts up a paywall, they're just going to go somewhere else. I think that what that misses is that at a time when so many news organizations have been shutting down their bureaus and curtailing their news gathering, we're getting to a point where there are likely to be fewer and fewer sources of, of reliable authoritative news and therefore the value and the, the premium people may be willing to pay for those goes up. I would like to see every newspaper and every uh, magazine have a network of bureaus all over the world gathering news. Maybe we'll return to that day. But at the moment where you're seeing such a contraction, I think what that does is put a real premium on, on authority and quality and, and rigor and, and organizations that are still investing in their, their sort of informational infrastructure. You hope so, right? Maybe this, you know, it may be wishful thinking, but, but I also think I have enormous faith in the, the genius of entrepreneurs in, in our business, in, the, in technology, in electronics companies, that they will figure this out, that, that, that people's desire for not just information, but for stories. And I and distinguish for, between them. And hopefully for accuracy and, for and accuracy integrity. Is, you know, that that isn't going away. And so I think figuring out a, a way to deliver it that suits people and that they are willing to pay for, we've seen how that happened in the music business. Um, Hollywood studios are facing this. It's, it is such a big question across so many industries, <coughs> and a lot of very big brains are figuring it out. I, you know, I'm not feeling a 
you know, apocalyptic about the future of our business at this point. I want to do a name game really quick. And by the way, you know, this is sort of an example of how time has had to think out of the box. And I think Rick Stengel's done a good job of not covering the week of the news, but kind of looking at the big picture or coming up with some kind of innovative concept that will differentiate the product, mm -hmm. you know, and so it won't feel old and stale by the time people get a cover story that happened, you know, on Tuesday right. when it, I guess time now comes out on Friday, right? right. All right, so let's play a quick name game, you oh, know, no. uh, just because, you know, it's interesting to hear your perspective. I've spent a lot of time recently with Rahm Emanuel, um, kind of the man of the moment, at least in political intrigue circles. So what do you think of him? I, isn't it interesting how, and this always happens, how there will be a character who, at some point, we need to have him be the vessel of the whole narrative. And so uh -huh. as soon as, as as the Obama presidency generally in healthcare in particular sort of ran onto the rocks and, you know, will they be able to pull this off or not? And did they blunder terribly in the way they approached it? And did they miss the opportunity? Once that narrative became sort of catnip for political reporters, you know, Rom was perfectly positioned to be the protagonist. It was, you know, you don't always want to have every story be about the president. So here right. was a colorful guy, a sort of profane, large than life character who was just perfect for telling whichever story you wanted about how he was truly the evil genius behind everything or he was the or under, just evil or you know whatever <laughs> any yeah. narrative you want you could find a way to have Rom be your your central character to it so you know I have no idea I guess it's the curse of being colorful you're right and interesting and dynamic because he sort of did attract a bunch of different narratives. Plus, you have particular... interesting brothers, and yeah, got, yeah, know, yeah. The hell, it's he's perfect. He's a, so he's a perfect cut sort off of... his middle finger at Arby's <laughs> from you know by a meat slicer. Okay, Sarah Palin. You've written a, a fair amount about Sarah Palin, yeah. um, and and I thought you wrote a, an interesting piece sort of during the campaign. Um, but but how do you feel about sort of Sarah Palin today? and her political future or the way that she is kind of conducting herself in general? I think she is one of the most fascinating figures on our stage right now. And those who dismiss her do so at their peril because when this summer, for instance, after you know her, she was widely pronounced kind of over after she resigned her office when a month later she inserted the phrase death panel with remember a you know one sentence posting on her facebook page so this is someone who understands how the the flow of information works right now the the accusation that healthcare reform was going to give us death panels you know was her entry at a moment where her stock was very low and look what the impact was. Does it matter that it wasn't really accurate? No. I mean, it matters in, the, in a sort of larger moral sense, sure. But if you're looking at the role that someone plays, how long a shadow they cast, um, I think it's extraordinary that when millions and millions of words had been spoken and written and blogged about this topic, that she figured out the words that would literally transform the, the debate. Um, that's an important skill or understanding or instinct that she has for what people respond to intellectually, emotionally, viscerally, instinctively. You know, when she at the at her, you know, her keynote tea party speech where she had that line about, so, you know, um, how's that hopey, hopey changey thing going for you? You know, again, the 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 ability to to sort of send like a laser beam, um, an idea into the very, very heart of whatever it is we're talking about. Um, in a way that everyone gets. They get it, they love it, they hate it, but everyone gets it, um, is, is a political skill uh, uh, that is no mean feat. And I think that she is, whatever she wants to do is going to be very interesting to watch. My, my gut sense is that it is not her greatest dream to be the occupant of the Oval Office, but I could be completely wrong about that. What do you, what do you see her doing? I think that, that being a... a is it a, a queen maker, a king maker, or both? Being in a position to to really influence um, the issues that she cares about, while also having a life, you know, that she's in control of. I think you know she has a much more she has much more attractive options for what one senses she wants that involves enormous potential power, but without all of the stuff that can go with it if you exercise that power in a traditional political framework. Right. I think she'll invent a kind of role that we have not seen before. It's not like she's following in someone's footsteps and she's going to be just like this or that person of the past. I, I think she's entirely capable of creating a position for herself in our national debate and conversation that is unprecedented. Barack Obama. 
Boy, talk about someone again who's where the narrative keeps changing. I, as a as a historian of presidents, I think the thing that that strikes me most about him is to have seen someone who who had the wind at his back in the way that he did on inauguration day, and to then look at where we are a year later is just an extraordinary story. And what strikes me about him um, watching from this distance is again. The, the loneliness of that job and the weight that falls on you of whatever his initial intentions and hopes were about what he was going to be able to do about Gitmo or be able to do about Afghanistan or in the Middle East. You know, today we have, we have you know, the Israeli ambassador saying our relations with Israel are at their worst point in 35 years. This is, on all of these fronts, much less, you know, on domestic policy, on health care. Um, this is not at all, of course, the way the story was supposed to go, and the you know I find it amazing that someone who had the advantages that he had at the outset has still struggled to the extent that he has to to realize all of those um, hopes for change. You can see why, though, in terms of the times we're living in, and and the enormous complex issues that he's had to contend with. I'm not excusing the missteps or, or oh, yeah, no. but I mean, it's, it, it's, uh, I think campaigning is very different than governing and, and governing is so incredibly complex. I think that's especially true when you're governing at a time of, you know, economic crisis and tremendous global right. challenges. And yeah, it's, and, and he, you know, to be fair, he said, you know, if you go back and he said, you know, this isn't going to be easy. This isn't, you know, it, in some ways you sometimes during the campaign almost heard this, this almost theme of worry that he had that people's hopes were unrealistic or their expectations would come, somehow come back to haunt him. It's like, you know, the Nobel Prize. Whoever has won the Nobel Prize and had that be essentially a bad thing. And really quickly, just on a light, cheesy note, what do you think of Kate Goslin? Why is she always on the cover of People magazine? Why do you think people are so fascinated? That, to me, it would be a good Nancy Gibbs article. Oh, see, I need more time to watch more television in order to be able to. I don't to... watch it, but I just see her but everywhere. She's just... Now, isn't that interesting that she that you don't have to watch a show in order to have its characters and its themes and its issues still be part of your conversation or, you know, part of your Twitter feed or whatever it is. It really is. isn't, it's... but I just thought I'd ask you because <laughs> it's a little off the wall. Um, but, but what do you think about people who are kind of entering the zeitgeist who, who are just... You can't really understand it or explain it. It just happens. The the notion of being famous for fame's own sake is is not. It feels like a modern invention. No, I think I, that's yeah. only because technology has has so facilitated. Did this. that happen in I, the early seventeen hundreds? I you know I bet it did. I bet it did, just in a different way. It I was, think this, and it, maybe it was called Nancy, notoriety. Then I smell and, a Nancy Gibbs essay okay. for Time Magazine. You can be my assignment editor. <laughs> do they assign you, or do you come up with your ideas? You know, I love it when people come to me with an idea because it's, it's you know, because I try not to do just what's in the news. It's, I'm always looking, always looking for topics. All right. Well, it's good to talk to you and congratulations again you. on your well-deserved promotion. Thanks, Nancy. And thank all of you for watching, by the way. And remember, you can follow me on Twitter and check out all the episodes of At Katie Couric anytime on cbsnews.com. Now stay tuned for another message from our sponsor, Dove.